What's going on? This is Brian Mazik, aka Unique Mazik. I am a fight guy, and I am here with my fellow fight guy and fellow Forbes contributor, Peter Kahn. What's going on today, Peter? Brian, everything's great. Uh, looking forward to another great show with the fight guys. Absolutely. We are powered by Fight TV and presented by Bet Online. And it is time to jump right into round one. All right, let's talk Errol Spence. And uh, it's been a lot of conversation about Errol Spence lately, and for good reason. Uh, had a fantastic fight on September 28th of 2019 against Sean Porter. Shortly after that, unfortunately, he had the uh, car accident that could have been tragic. And thankfully, he came out um, came out of it. He did have some serious injuries that he had to recover from. But it seems as though... Um, it's given him like a new perspective, so to speak. So every every time you hear him talk since then, it's been like really, he seems to be far more aware of what's happening. Uh, and so recently he was on the All the Smoke podcast with Steven Jackson. Uh, and, uh, you, you know, he, he was va basically talking about his perspective now, uh, Steven Jackson and, my, and Matt Barnes. And he says, right now I'm pretty much locked in. Uh, I'm not snacking on nothing. I'm locked in. If I show you my refrigerator right now, there's nothing in there but water. I'm locked in. I got all my organic foods and I'm trying to eat healthy. He went on to say, I'm not trying to go back to where I used to. I go up to like 190, 180, 150 pounds. I try to stay at 160. So when a, uh, a fight comes, it won't be hard. It used to be hard on me. I weigh like 180 pounds. And the next thing you know, I got a press conference. So then I got a press conference and then I'm spending my whole day at the press conference and gained like six pounds. Now we're trying to do it the right way. Like when I was broke and hungry, when I used to weigh 160, 158 and then got down to 147 real smooth. So let me, you tell me what your initial reaction is when you hear him say that. Maturity. I, I think that uh, Errol is maturing. I think that what happens is as you get older as a fighter, you realize the body reacts differently. Things change. It's not as easy to cut weight um, because you've put your body through that process so many times. And I think he's just being honest and truthful, not just with himself, but with everybody else by saying, I'm not snacking. I'm not letting myself blow up because he knows in the past he was able to put in the work. He was able to get disciplined when he needed to. Um, and then he would make the weight. But I think he realized he was making it more difficult on himself. And, and maybe there were other things that were contributing to, to weight gain. And I think he was making, you know, also saying there's nothing but water refrigerator. And I see that as a positive thing. I see it as him maturing, him letting everybody know that he's very serious about uh, his place in, in, in the world of professional boxing. And when things get back moving in, in you know, uh, full steam ahead, uh, he, he's going to be ready to perform and show everyone why he deserves to be in the conversation as one of the top fighters in the world. Yeah, I think it's really I, I'm I'm really happy to to see it because I, I personally have always really liked Errol. Had some time we spent some time with uh, Errol's cousin uh, in L.A. and I know you know him and mm -hmm. just seems like a really tight knit little core unit that they yep. have in the family and friends. And that that accident, I remember that morning. Uh, I was gonna I was actually I was actually flying to L.A. for a NBA 2K event that morning. Mm -hmm. And it hit and it just it literally paused me. And I was just like, I, I'm like supposed to be getting ready to go to uh, to the airport. And I'm just like, whoa. So uh, it, clearly it, it didn't happen personally to me, but to him, it, it clearly made a, a, an impact on his life. And uh, I'm hoping that, yeah, he can just continue to put his best foot forward. If you think about it, if Errol was going through such unnatural weight cuts, you know, before and still performing at the level that he was performing at. Imagine what he looks like now, not allowing himself to go up past 160 pounds and then getting down to 147. And then inevitably, I would say when he does move up to 154 or 160, because at some point that's probably going to happen, he'll then be fighting even closer to what his walk around weight is, which is even less of a stress on him when it comes to fight. So we might actually, dare I say, see the best of Errol Spence at 160 or 154, even though he's 30 already. So um, 
I don't know. I think it's all around, just all around good news. All around good news. Yeah, I mean, just you know, one more point. I, I, and you know, maybe you'll agree or disagree here. Um, but from what I've found managing fighters and working with fighters, I've found that welterweights mm-hmm. have sometimes the hardest weight cuts, mm-hmm. and and I think it's because the height to welterweight ratio allows mm-hmm. some of these guys to naturally put on, even without being uh, out of control, yep. just simply eating uh, more calories, not as training as hard, their body naturally can, ca- the frame can carry more yeah. weight and they don't look out of shape. No. They don't look heavy. No. But they can easily get to 175 yes. without even really looking like they weigh 175. Right, because if you think about it, right, if you look at it, Errol Spence and Roy Jones Jr. are around the same height, you know, and, and Roy Jones, I mean, has there ever been a person that carried 175 better than Roy? <laughs> I mean, just right. the way an in-shape Roy, we talk about shredded, you know what I'm saying? Not a what would look like an inch of fat on him. Right. And we're talking about two guys that are close to in the same height, but one guy has to drop down 28 more pounds to make weight. So I see clearly. it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I see I see the 130 pound division and the mm-hmm. welterweight division. They just seem to be, you know, the, the super featherweight and welterweights have always to me personally, mm-hmm. you know, some people might disagree, but just from my own experience seem to be out of all the weight cuts that I'm around the toughest weight cuts. Lightweights seem to be the easiest for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I don't. <laughs> right. However, however, I would say light heavyweight is mm-hmm. also an issue. Mm. And, and, and that's like where that super middleweight division comes in, right? Right. Guys that can't get down the middle, but they're not heavy enough or they're not as big. Mm-hmm. Those light heavies get over 200 pounds. Yeah. 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 Some, of them, some of them could arguably say, you know what? I'll be a, I'll be a heavyweight at 205, you know? Yeah. I mean, and they, get, and they get down to 175, but it's tough. I mean, you're 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, right. If you're 6'2", six, 6'3", six, and you you're 200, 205 pounds, you're in good regular shape. It's well, just if you're trying I mean, to make light heavyweight, you're 30 pounds over. Well, look, look at the ratio. How yeah. tall is Deontay? 6'7". Six, what, six, six, what did he weigh for the first Fury fight? 217. Right. So yeah. you see what I'm saying? It's kind of yeah. relative. Yeah, for and sure. So, for so sure. I just think, I think, you know, to wrap this up, Errol Spence is showing growth. Yes, and I think that uh, it, it, you know, makes me look forward to seeing how he comes back. And I think, th- I think there's like a renewed, just th- from what he's saying, yes. right? And the way he's reiterated, I mean, that quote, he reiterated the same thing three times. Yeah. And it just leads you to believe that he really wants to, that this whole pause, um, mm-hmm. that also kept him home. Yes. Uh, you know, might have enlightened him a little bit and, and put him back on track. Yeah, he even talked about, he said uh, in another quote, and, and I know we're going to move on, but he had, it mentioned also how the quarantine was a bit of a blessing for him because it just kept him home and kept him focused. And, you know, everything happens for a reason, man, all over the place. And, you know, it's hard to draw and make heads or tails of everything. But, you know, there I believe there are going to be some people who come out of this with a better appreciation for certain things that they have that they may have taken for granted. And that's across all walks of life, including obviously boxing. So we'll see how, uh, how it all tra- uh, transpires. But yeah, I am even more interested in seeing Errol Spence's return fight now than I was before. So let's go into our first yeah. between the rounds. All right, so Peter, I'm gonna talk to mm-hmm. you. I, I know that there was something that was um, uh, being said, or you're going to let me know about uh, what's going on with with Bob Arum and some of the things that he's maneuvering or attempting to maneuver in regards to fighter pay and so on and so forth. Right. All right. So uh, I saw a story today on Boxing mm-hmm. Scene mm-hmm. where uh, Bob Arum had expressed that fighters might need to start looking mm-hmm. at lower guarantees and more upside on pay per views. And the thought process being that uh, the state of boxing and the difficulty of being able to get pay-per-view numbers uh, that could, you know, uh, be a place where promoters can make a a profit and and could operate successfully, uh, uh, you know, um, indicating and suggesting 
that if they went back to a $40 per pay-per-view model, and I think he used the Hagler Hearns uh, example. Now, of course, that's you know over 30 years ago, but still using that as a, as an example as to where you know there was a, a pay-per-view was half the amount of money that it is today when you're looking at maybe like a $79.99, basically an $80 pay-per-view, that the fighter shouldn't be hung up on the actual guarantee because you know in a lot of these pay-per-views the the fighters will be guaranteed x amount of dollars and then they will participate on the actual pay-per-view revenue and what bob is suggesting is that the fighters accept a lower guarantee lower minimum guarantee and operate more on the success of the pay-per-view and the upside so i'm curious to see what you think about that as a manager i have my ideas about that but I'm curious to see what you think about it, and then we can go back and forth in the championship round. Absolutely. Let's step into round two. All right. We're staying on the topic of top rank, uh, or at least things generating from top rank. And uh, top ranks tied to Buff had a very, I, I, you know what, I want, I'm going to tell you one thing I really like about top rank and their officials. I know that in business, there's always something, certain things that have to be strategically withheld, but you seem to get the most meat <laughs> from when they speak mm -hmm. than most of the other promotions. You know, when some of the other promotion promoters talk, it's just kind of like, okay, it's, we're doing business. But sometimes every once in a while with top rank, you actually feel like you're getting people giving some level of information. Right. So Todd DeBuff was talking about the best location for an Anthony Joshua Tyson Fury fight, which I know you had expressed an opinion about and saying that it would be a travesty if it wasn't held in London. Right. But Todd is of the belief that the best place for it is in the United States. So he says that, um, he says, uh, my heart of hearts tells me that would be uh, the ideal place, but obviously we would uh, be open to any site and any perspective dynamic that would be different. To do a fight in the UK would be fantastic, both guys are larger than life and to sync that up with the United States. Uh, but as we, um, but as we just said, if, uh, if it was an old world, we just did under $17 million, um, with a fury and wilder. And I'm not sure that there was a gate in the UK that's ever done that. I think we'd have to weigh all the different circumstances. And if there was outside locations like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Asia, whatever, we would obviously weigh those too. Uh, he also says, I think that the success of the big events, the biggest events in history of combat sports have originated from America. I keep going back to that. I think the impact and the success of pay-per-view being distributed from the United States to the late hours or early hours, let's call it in the UK, we've seen that be very successful and the fans are connected and will stay up. Um, I think that Todd is kind of talking about this from a more holistic overall global standpoint and obviously generating the most money from every possible place. Mm -hmm. I think if, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, your perspective is more from a, a, a legacy standpoint and also almost like a, um, a, a something of a, um, an acknowledgement or an appreciation being shown to British fans who have quite honestly, been far more loyal to the sport than American boxing fans. Mm -hmm. And so because this is a fight that would put the champions of champions from this, you know, from the UK against each other, it, it kind of doesn't matter where the, where all the money could come from, what matter, because they're going to make a ton of money where, I mean, they could fight in your backyard. They're going to make, they're going to make money, but secondary that's pretty much secondary to the, making sure that it takes place in the place where it should take place is that kind of yeah well i mean there are many different things here number mm -hmm. one um and i think you, you know you kind of hit the nail on the head mm -hmm. you know todd is like the conscience of top rank mm -hmm. bob's the figurehead and don't get me wrong you know bob's bob's legendary iconic yes he is okay but todd is a businessman Mm -hmm. Todd really has his finger in, in every different uh, facet of the business from just all, all avenues, from every, every, every department, every aspect, right? Because he's ultimately responsible. And I think that, you know, look, my perspective, when I said I thought it would be a travesty if this fight were to take place in Saudi Arabia, was that I felt that if, if just, it, 
It could be the biggest fight in British boxing history. Now, to Todd's point, okay, yes, uh, the $17 million in change was the third largest gate in heavyweight championship fight history for Nevada, right? So the third biggest fight in Nevada heavyweight championship history as far as purse was concerned. The pay-per-view was a bit underwhelming compared to their expectations. Now, apparently from what I've heard, they needed to exceed 1 million buys to break even. Mm -hmm. And so I think from what we've heard, it was in the 700,000s. Does that sound accurate to you? Uh, I, I have to double check. I, I'm, it, I'm sure it won't be right. difficult at all to, uh, to find out. So, so there's two things. One, right? I understand what he's saying from a time zone perspective. However, uh, a show in the evening in the UK is, you know, around 5 p.m. Eastern U.S. time, which is very conducive for mm -hmm. fans to tune in. So I don't necessarily know if that's, you know, if, if we're just looking at it from the USA and Europe standpoint, what, where else in the world would, would we garner, you know, the biggest pay-per-view numbers, right? Um, the other thing is we have to look at what was the gate revenue that was reported for Joshua Klitschko? Because I uh, think... No, I, I, I don't know that off the top of my head. I have to look that up. But just to answer your previous question, um, there was reported an extraordinarily high level of piracy for uh, the, the rematch. They said they estimate somewhere between 10 to 20 million fans watched it via piracy. Right. But even with that, the pay-per-view buys were between 800,000 to 850,000. Okay. This is per Sports Illustrated. Right. But this all goes back to my mm -hmm. between the rounds, which you're going to get into. But now you're talking about maybe less of a guarantee in order for the promoter to be able to break even or make a profit, you know, having everyone work together in that sense. I think we'd have to look at two things. One, what would the gate revenue possibly be if there was a sold out Wembley, you know, with the properly scaling it and, and looking to un get an understanding of what you could compare it to mm -hmm. that's happened previously. Mm -hmm. And then two, understanding how uh, having it in the United States, say at the MGM Grand or so, would, would connect better to the U.S. audience that would inspire a bigger pay-per-view and bigger gate revenue, because that's ultimately what it comes down to. It really comes down to two things, right? The pay-per-view is where you're going to get the most money. The gate revenue is where you're going to get the second most money. And sponsorships where you're going to get the third most money. So, you know, if the argument can be made that the United States can provide higher numbers on all three of those things, then sure, it should be here. But you have something that has a chance to, to make history, mm -hmm. which is two heavyweight fighters from the UK fighting for the undisputed heavyweight championship of the world. Doing that in front of 100,000 people in a Wembley Stadium, I just I think it would be you know, uh, one of the biggest events ever. Yeah, I, it definitely would be one of the biggest events ever in 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 the UK. Um, and remember, there's two promoters here. Yes, yes. So, so you it, know that, that, that also plays with, into it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, but I would think that, yeah. Uh, but you know what? I, the thing of it is, is that that Eddie has seemingly been really open to having Joshua come here to fight. Sure. Um, so I don't know that I don't know. I don't know that Top Rank and Bob would get a lot of pushback. Or Top Rank and Frank Warren. Would, uh, I mean, Frank Warren and ESPN would get a lot of pushback from saying that the fight should be in the United States. I don't know. So I'm talking as a fan. Yeah. OK. Todd's talking as a businessman, which I understand his points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm oh, talking. Oh, I'm oh, talking oh. as a fan. As a as a as a and as, as a, a boxing fan, a historical a historical yeah, boxing fan, absolutely. I mean, it's almost like you know. It, so if 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 Tego and Richard Comey fought, mm -hmm. that fight should be in Ghana. Hey, the soccer stadium in Accra, where the where the Black Stars play. Yes, it should. That would be the. Now maybe they don't make as much money. If right. they as if if they fought in Madison Square Garden, and obviously these are two stars that are nowhere near on the level of they don't have the right. global appeal that right. those guys have. But, for, but as but a in fan, their country, right? In oh, in their in their country, oh right. my God, yes, right. you know what I'm saying. Right. So, you know, it's so I, I totally get it. I totally get it. I totally get it. So let's. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to argue with. It. I don't feel like I've argued with you enough today. 
You know, I might, I might just punch you after. I don't like agreeing with you all the time, but like we're we're agreeing and it's making me uncomfortable. Yeah, it is. It's can we please weird. get to like ask the fight guys or something so something, I can argue with so you? We get, I will manufacture something. Thank you. So that's so let's go to between the rounds. Our next between the rounds. And I know you got something for me. You got well, something for me on the UFC side. I mean, look, it's uh, UFC 249 is tomorrow. Um, I've already bought my pay per view. Uh, uh -oh. it's in J Jacksonville, Florida. Okay. Live sports is back. Combat sports is back. Dana White and the UFC have taken a big step to get things moving, give them all the credit in the world. Uh, but this, not only as you've been saying for the past few weeks, is maybe, I mean, besides being best card of the year, maybe one of the best cards ever. There certainly has the potential to be some big upsets. And I know you had something to say about that. Yeah, and I am going to kind of go into it in our championship rounds and because there are some possibilities here. There definitely are some possibilities on the upside side, uh, upset side. And I've already actually, if you guys have, haven't yet subscribed, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Uh, I've already put out uh, breakout videos, odds, predictions, pieces for every single fight on this card. If you did miss those, I'm going to tell you which one is my upset pick, my best upset pick for this particular card in the championship rounds. Let's jump into round three. And this is where we ask the fight, guys. All right. So we got our first question. And I disagree. There you go. Let's get it started right. Well, our first question comes, uh, if anybody didn't you know, catch wind of this, uh, Mike Tyson was offered uh, $20 million to fight for a bare knuckle fighting championship. Mm. Uh, I wrote about it first in, <laughs> over heavy.com. And uh, you know, I had a quote from the president of BKFC, David Feldman, just basically saying the offer was made. There's nothing in there talking about whether or not Mike accepted it or anything like that, just that the offer was made right. and that uh, BKFC was open to working with Mike in a variety of unspecified ways. No response from Mike at all, just that the conversation and just that that offer was initially made. So we're talking about Mike Tyson. So since mm -hmm. we're talking about Mike Tyson, the mere mention of his name yes. is going to get people talking. And so uh, I covered this in the video, and this was one of the responses from Jeffrey Moneybags Beats the House. Ooh. He said, let's be real. If they are really Mike Tyson fans, no one wants to see Mike Tyson get hit by anyone. These new jokers only want to see Mike hit someone. But the reality is Mike will not come back because, number one, he will have to be tested. And number two, he will be tested. And number three, at 53, if the fight goes past two rounds, he will be tested in the worst way with other punchers, punches from heavyweights bigger and younger than him. And he could very well get very, very hurt. I hope his friends talk him out of it. However, it would be nice to see Mike go back to his roots, capturing the bare knuckle fighting championship title, put him in there with Russian Sergey Karatinov. Karatinov with Sleep Lombard and uh, he's talking about Hector Lombard and Shannon Briggs on the same night in BKFC. It's a lot there to mm -hmm. respond to. Uh, first, I will. Uh, I, like, first, I like his name. I like his name. Jeffrey Moneybags beats the house. He sounds like a guy that needs to leave a comment so we can give him a code to go to bet online and get a yes. really good bonus and get a really good bonus. I guess this is this what. So if you, if you're watching, comment and you know Jeffrey Moneybags we, we, beats the house. Yes, yeah, you got to go to bed online. Yes. So, so what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts, Brian? So, I, first of all, I, I I tend to almost agree that um, people are looking at this in a weird way. Mike Tyson is like a mythical character to people. It's like a superhero, and they're actually not really comfortable with the thought of him doing anything except for smashing, Hulk smash, kind of a thing. Right. And they don't want to bother thinking about the fact that if he is in a real fight. Mm -hmm that there's a chance he could lose. Right. There's a chance you won't get that dopamine effect that you're looking for that you get when he crushes a guy and stands over him after landing a vicious combination of which he hasn't really landed in that capacity in over 15 years. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. People don't want to think of it that way. They rather go to Twitter after they see rumors of him possibly fighting and they rather say stuff like, uh, I read, I wouldn't fight Mike Tyson in a bare knuckle fight unless you gave me two bricks, a stick and a rock, you know, that kind of stuff. That's fun to tweet. 
right. it's not necessarily fun to talk about oh yeah what if he doesn't win you know mm -hmm. so i do think that uh jeffrey is correct in saying that these new fans they're they're in love with the image of the fasana of mike tyson but they're not thinking about the man himself mm -hmm. because he's still 53 years old right so i i do think that i don't i mean you know so yeah that that's pretty much how i think of it i, I would tend to mostly agree with what he said sure i mean look let's let's remember a few things here this this just didn't come out of thin air mm -hmm. mike posted a video hitting the pads in a carefully orchestrated video with his trainer yelling ko and then hashtagging it with certain hashtags it seemed like he was promoting bad boys for life on dvd yeah, yeah it was like an acknowledgement i think it may have been okay it looked like it was a promotion that they would get a lot of traction because they knew that that video would go viral and so they knew they could piggyback it not a bad idea mm -hmm. right using mike's uh his strength on social right now to get to an audience a uh, mm -hmm. captive audience and look they know they can push some buttons and show mike being mike and and people just they they get to relive the past and that fantasy of mm -hmm. who mike was um and and look if mike at 53 wants to come back and participate in the sport in which he's iconic it doesn't necessarily mean that he has to do something competitive if he wants to do an exhibition that raises money for charity that has something really nice attached to it then great as long as he's not putting himself in any real risk right then i think we'll see what happens i think it's a long way off from happening mm -hmm. i think that you know one of the biggest questions i have is can a 53 year old man no matter who they are get sanctioned can you get licensed by any state can you pass the physical can you pass everything that they're going to ask you to pass that's number one and number two um if you do fight who are you fighting Mm -hmm. and, 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 want, and if you're fighting in a four-round exhibition that's 12 minutes, um, maybe it's just for Mike. Maybe it's just for Mike. You know, maybe it's just something he wants to do on his terms, the way he wants to do it. Why does it have to be, why does it have to be defined by everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's one of the best ever. Right. So everyone has to have an opinion because some people – the fantasy, some people have never seen Mike fight. They weren't alive. Right. And they would just love to see that. And then there's that fantasy of people that remember who Mike was, that there's this hope. It, it would be like Michael Jordan taking the court and wanting to see him be Michael Jordan. Yeah. A, he wouldn't be able to play a full game. B, he just might not be able to keep up. Yeah. It is what it is. You, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean... What do you have to say? Mike, Mike is 57. So, I mean, I'm talking about Michael Jordan. Right. He's 57. But you it's know great. what I'm saying. You know, oh, I mean, absolutely. it's, absolutely. listen, but Mike put it out there. You yeah. don't put it out there if you don't want to inspire dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it's really, um, it's really something because things just take, take off like crazy. And here's the thing though. When you are Mike Tyson, you got to know, and he probably does that any little thing I do or say can take on a life of its own. It's right. the good side of the fame that you enjoy. I mean, it's the other side of the fame that you enjoy. You know, you, you are Mike Tyson. So there's certain things that are afforded to you because you are Mike Tyson, but then there's a flip side and uh, something depending on how you take it, or maybe a negative side to every little thing that you do. So you, it's the old adage of you got to take the good with the bad. I, and I and, think that that's what that is. An analogy to that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I took Wesley Snipes as a guest mm -hmm. of the Triple G to Revinchenko fight. Mm -hmm. He couldn't walk one, two feet right. without people stopping, touching, wanting to take a picture, went, you know, and he had his two sons with him, went in the bathroom, people just putting up their phones in his face and him asking for his... And I apologize to him after because, you know, people run up to him and they do every quote that they know from New Jack City, from they call him <laughs> Willie Mays Hayes. Like, I, it's when you really think about the iconic actor oh, that, yeah. he, that he is, right, yeah, in the history. Yeah. So Am I, I my brother's keeper? Right, right. So, Am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> okay, 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 you know. So anyway, I, I, I apologize in the back yeah. after. I'm like, man, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. He goes, hey, comes to the territory. 
comes with the territory. That's what he said to me. And I said, and, okay. See, that's that's maturity. Right. It's okay. That that's so you know. So I'm like, so you know what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know this happens. I mean, he's, he's got he's got he's, he's got a putting a like a you know piece of food in his mouth right in that's, the back in the back and somebody. people come up they don't stop and then you know, I was just yeah. like oh I was like I, yeah. I felt I felt bad I'm like you know I thought I was doing a good thing so yeah yeah it, I mean you know it's it's uh you have to learn how to be famous but I think Mike knows the type of response he was gonna gonna get by showing mm -hmm. he didn't just sit there and talk he showed himself hitting the mitts yeah yeah, and he's gotten himself in ridiculous shape. It looks which great. Would, which will let you, which would make you believe he's thinking about it. You know what I mean? It just is what it is. So let's look at our next Ask the Fight Guys question. And this one comes from Victor Valdez. And this comment comes on uh, one of our videos where we talked about uh, a rumor that um, Floyd Mayweather is not only coming back, but coming back and considering a fight uh, against Adrian Broner. Mm -hmm. So Victor Valdez says that Floyd will walk away with another hundred million dollars for 36 minutes of easy. You see the easy work point at him and say easy work. <laughs> That's one of my favorite call and responses that I've seen Floyd do. It's just it was hilarious. Mm -hmm. Pointed to easy work. Yeah, that. Um, um, I mean, fighting Broner is not the same as fighting Conor McGregor. That's a chance he could lose. Mm -hmm. That's a chance he could. I mean, he's older, you know. Uh, I mean, I mean, obviously we're talking about like Floyd in his prime. I think he boxes circles around Adrian Broner, but at his age, you know, was it 42, 43, something, uh, something like that. Something like that. It's his, at his age, it, it, it could be interesting, which is why when I mentioned that we talked about this before, probably um, 42, right? Yeah, He's there is a, 42, there's right? something like that. Something like yeah. that. I know it's a birthday. I know his birthday's in February. So I, it's, it's actually, it's right around Michael Jordan's birthday. And we, talking a lot about Michael Jordan today, but yes. uh, it's right around the same time. Um, but because of his age, it, it, it would be somewhat interesting. And I think because the only reason why it would be interesting is because Broner generally isn't exactly what you might think he should be. Uh, no, Floyd just turned 43 in February. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. February, so, was, so Jordan's February 17? Yes. February 17, 1963. Okay. Uh, so if I, you, I only know if, that I only know that for one reason. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, I would it, never know. Yeah, it, I if you're in Chicago, you if you're from Chicago and you were born and uh, around during all of this stuff that everybody is just now getting made acquainted to with the Last Dance, you probably just know Michael Jordan's birthday just just off top. Just if. As a oh, as a oh, Chicago, I only know it's because it's the day before my birthday. Yeah, Sorry, I know. I know. Okay. I know. That's why you know. But I'm saying, in as a Chicago, and well, Floyd's yeah. 43. Yeah, Floyd's 43. Okay. Yeah, he's 43. So, at 43 against Broner, who's 30, 31, I think now, mm -hmm. um, it shouldn't be interesting. Really, it shouldn't. The fact that it's interesting is probably a little bit of a discredit to Broner. Mm -hmm. uh, because I don't think anybody would say Floyd Errol Spence in, would be interesting. I don't think anybody would say Floyd Terrence Crawford. I mean, it would be interesting to see happen because of the names, but I, I would venture to say that Floyd Errol Spence, Floyd goes in as an underdog. Listen, Manny Pacquiao, Errol Spence Jr., Manny, why not exit, you know, stage right? Like, he was yeah. gone. Like, why yeah. not? I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm saying like, and even like, okay, Floyd Terrence Crawford, Floyd goes in as right. an underdog in that fight. So what are we getting out of here? What, what do we what do we want to say to this guy and ask the fight guys? Well, we 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 you know I, I am I pretty much said I'm in agreement with him that it would yeah. be probably I don't know I wouldn't use the word easy yeah but I would say yeah it would be a payday right. and he'd win. So I, I disagree on two things. One, no one's earning a hundred million. Two, mm, I, I don't think. Okay, good. We disagreed. I don't mm -hmm. think it's no one's making a hundred million, um, and. Two, uh, I don't know if it's thirty minutes of easy, thirty-six minutes of easy work, but uh, definitely, uh, you know, definitely intriguing. Just, so just because your your concept that he doesn't make a hundred million is that based on the cl current climate? Of yeah, okay. that's what I'm. Okay. That's what I'm I can dig with. I can dig that. Yeah. Now, yeah. in normal circumstances, yes, I he he get a hundred million. Yeah, I just think. Like we're talking about now, like right now, right? Yeah, right it. now. I mean, yeah. right now. Five, yeah, I if, if this fight took place five years ago, you 
No, I don't mean five years it's, ago. I mean outside of the pandemic. That's what yeah, I'm that's saying. what I'm saying. I'm I'm saying to you, like, yes, he's not. It just can't. I don't think the market could justify it. That's all. Yes, right now. Yeah, I would agree. Right now. Would, yeah. I well, we're talking about you know six months. It's five. If this fight happens, it happens within the next six months. Yeah. Yeah. Before the end of the because year. remember you you need a full audience. You need a full audience, and Floyd's forty three. And if we keep waiting, you'll be forty four, right. and it's just going to keep on getting. And 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 Broner needs to fight, otherwise his inactivity is just going to become a problem. Yes. Then it comes down to what weight do they fight at? Mm -hmm. So it's you know we'll see. We'll not see. a bad question, but you know no, no, we'll see. Not, wasn't actually a question. What we would like to see right. is more people asking, ask the fight guys with an actual question of something that we haven't even talked about. That's right. what we would like to see because expand us push us right is what we're looking for make right? us fight make us fight yeah something fight, fight hey somebody made a comment that said this should just be called the fight guy con's terrible i saw that i did <laughs> it was uh, I, I i'm gonna send my cousin 20 dollars uh, for that comment. Uh, <laughs> i laughed i laughed too I, it was funny i i laughed i, I did uh, laugh you, know, you don't, right, so you don't agree you don't agree with someone you're terrible Right. <laughs> you don't know that that's how life works. The fact that people a... take time to sit there and express the very thought. To me, it's a compliment. Hey, I, I, I hear you. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's just, it's pretty funny to me, though. Okay. All right. So let's jump into our championship rounds. All right. First on the ledger, you were talking. We were talking about. Uh, we were talking about Joshua, uh, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, we were, no, we're actually we we're talking no. about the, the, the Bob Arum and yep. guys taking less money. Right. Less guaranteed. I, I, Not less money. Uh, less, less guaranteed, less guaranteed money. money. All right. So I ultimately feel and changing the model and changing the model. I ultimately feel that a lot of people. Mm -hmm. in the boxing and combat sports world, but specifically boxing, yes, need to be open to doing business in some different ways because right. of what's going on in the world right now. Mm -hmm. Staying steadfast and immovable in this whole concept of this is the way it's been done, this is the way we always do it, and this is, I think it's going to cause some people to lose opportunities and to lose money because they're too rigid in their in their whatever they but their belief is of their own personal value whatever their belief is in their their motto what they've done for 45 years and that that could be talking about a promoter uh the first part could be talking about a fighter everybody needs to be open to doing business in some different ways and i even think that there's a there's something that uh to be said about uh, this concept that keeps being tossed back and forth. And even you've said it a few times. Oh, in order to do that fight, you got to have a live gate. Mm -hmm. I hear you. And mm -hmm. I understand why that, why you're saying that. But there are certain fights that I feel like because of maybe the age of the fighter and maybe some other circumstances where I think it would be better to, eh, to at least have the fight than to sit up and say, well, we're going to wait until crowds can come. And that doesn't happen in a time period enough where the, the fight can actually realistically take place in a way that is even believable, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so I do think even in that standpoint, there is some room for some movement there that, that isn't currently being shown. Uh, but from a fighter standpoint, um, I think, and I said this to Lou DeBella when he was on the show with us, Mm -hmm. I think that there are going to be some guys who will, who are willing to step up and fight in some ways who have a great platform for which to endear themselves to boxing fans. And I think it will create an indelible image in the, in the minds of certain fight fans that are like, you know what, during quarantine, when whatever was going on, this dude stepped up and he was willing to fight and he made sure that he, you know, he, he, he made a point of telling the fans, he made a point of letting everybody know, hey, I'm doing this to entertain people, you know, it's people at home who, who need a break, who need some sort of escape. And we get an opportunity to get out here and provide that escape for people. And I don't take that lightly. There's going to be somebody who's who's 
connected enough and, you know, not tone deaf and will understand that, man, I got a great opportunity. And maybe I'm maybe at the end of the day, I'm a C class or B class fighter, but I may be able to position myself. You know, I, I, I'll give you an example. Arturo Gotti and, and Mickey Ward are they were not great fighters from a talent standpoint, not great. Like they were good fighters. They weren't great fighters, but their their trilogy, their program came along at a right time and it delivered the kind of action that just grabbed people so much to the point where the, their their series has made it appear to boxing fans who are not as analytical or as critical, it has made it appear as those two guys were actually better fighters than they're actually than they actually were because of how legendary and iconic that series was. So I think that it's a there's a lot to be said for taking advantage of a moment. And I think right now, this situation, this quarantine is creating a moment for somebody. And I'm waiting to see who's gonna grab it. I mean that's a lot to take in right there. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to go Michael. Scott. I mean, that's like I'm the not going to go Michael. Listen, Scott the Blue Angels just just flew <laughs> over my house. Uh huh. Okay, and they went all the way from Homestead uh -huh. to Boca Raton. They came right. back and yeah. looped around. That's what I feel like this whole thing just did. Yes. Yes. So I will say this: um, fighters understand right now mm -hmm. that there are going to be some adjustments. Yeah. Because gay revenue does matter. Mm -hmm. Now, on some shows, it could be a very small gate revenue. Mm -hmm. On other shows, it could be a, a large gate revenue. Promoters use some of that, depending on the show, to offset costs. You better believe on a Wilder Fury 2, mm -hmm. every bit of that $17 million went in to pay those fighters. With the pay-per-view where the promoters were relying on making the remainder of that money on the profit. So... I would say yes. There are some instances where fighters should make um, uh, should acquiesce a little bit, mm -hmm. but the promoter still promoting the fights under different circumstances. Really, what they're losing out on is the gate revenue. What the fighters are doing is still the same. So now, what you're doing is the fighters still fighting the same fight for less money, mm -hmm. taking the same risk. Um, but doing it for less money. Mm -hmm. And I would say that, okay, fine. You know what? All my guys know that that's what's to be expected. And they know that the guys that get the phone call and are ready and could be prepared in four weeks, as opposed to maybe a six or seven or eight week camp are going to be the guys that get the call and fight on television. Mm -hmm. And I would say that that's okay. Mm-hmm. As long as when things resume back to normal, the market adjusts. Right. But if they start coming back, meeting the promoters, and say, well, you got this in the last fight, that's not going to fly. The market, there's going to have to be a market correction once fans start to sell arenas back out. Mm -hmm. So in the short term, I think everybody in, in what's best for the sport to move forward will make some adjustments because we know the promoters are. We know that they don't have to put on shows, but they are going to put on shows and they are going to give up a, a chunk of revenue. So the fighters understand that. And so to, to, to your point, sure, some people can step up. I, I don't know if a world title fight that would normally sell out a Madison Square Garden or MGM Grand is for this model, um, simply for the enjoyment of the fans when the fighter that loses could not maybe have a pathway back and this could have been a, a, a way to create some financial security. I understand people not wanting to do that. But for some of the smaller fights that are still competitive and important, like, let's be real. There are world title fights that can't draw more than 3,000 people. You know, you know, here's where I wonder, right? And, I, and I'm certainly not dismissing the relevancy or the importance of gate revenue. But what I'm saying is all of these promoters and, you know, if you if a fighter has a really strong manager, of course, there's there's analytics, there's numbers that are pulled mm -hmm. to say, OK, here's my percentage 
mm -hmm. of, of of my take that comes mm -hmm. from live gate all right mm -hmm. so we you estimate you know um you talk to different people and say okay what uh similar fights in the hit in history how how much money had, had uh, you know how much money has been generated from live gate for this fight and you're trying to find the comps so you say okay well this is whatever you know so and so took home from here this whatever so then at that point you then start to try to uh explore other avenues and you say what is the best way non-conventional because we're in a non-conventional situation what's the best non-conventional way to try to make up as much of what i would have gotten from mm -hmm. a live gate that i can do that may break the mold in terms of because we're in a mold a broken mold type of a society and situation right now because of this pandemic what right. is it that can be done like i remember um uh i forget which company it was i know you remember um when bernard hopkins came out with the golden palace uh, golden palace on his back is that what you're I asking remember, yes okay the, the first time yeah the first time i saw that yeah i was like whoa what is i said this is insane what yeah. is going on but bernard caught, H, caught hbo off guard yeah bernard took a payday home for that you know yes and, and obviously I, i'm not going to suggest that him putting golden palace on his back was the equivalent of live gate what what somebody would get from a live gate what i'm saying is it is now time to start to try to break the mold in regards to how you can generate revenue and because you can prepare for a show because you can outfit in a, a, a venue however you want to do it and mm -hmm. you are and you're knowing that you're doing this in a broadcast sort of a studio type of format mm -hmm. now I got to stop thinking like a boxing promoter from 1970, 1980, 1990 to 2000s, early 2000s. I got to stop thinking like that. I got to start thinking like a television production show. How are, what are all the ways that I can try to make up this live gate? And I, I'm not sure from what I'm hearing from boxing people, if that, if those conversations are, are being had. So I think that, like I said, I think, Bob's correct. I do think that fighters need to be more open-minded and be willing to do some things that maybe they wouldn't have done in the past. But I also think that promoters and networks also need to be looking at the same type of thing. So, all right, But isn't it all relative? If you're dropping the pay-per-view price, mm -hmm. then how's the fighter really, are you, it only works if you're giving them a, if you're lowering the guarantee mm -hmm. and then dropping the pay-per-view price, the well, only yeah, thing really is you have to give them a higher percentage. Yeah, I'm not really speaking specifically to what Bob's suggestion okay. was, because I'm not saying that that necessarily right. is the answer, but right. I'm saying conceptually, fighters being open-minded to taking some things that would have traditionally and, meant less. And remember what I'm saying to you. Mm -hmm. I get it. I totally get what you're saying. Right. And I always cut you off. It's okay. You know, um, it's like you're the, like a but, bad driver. You but the fighters problem. never take less risk. Just keep that in mind. Never take less risk. They no. never take less risk, ever. But the risk, the risk is of, the same. They're in the business of taking risk, and the same. It's 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 all about accepting your your current situation, right? So a fighter getting into a ring at you know in his in the eleventh fight of his career. Okay, perfect example. Floyd fought Oscar. He mm -hmm. knew when he fought Oscar, he was the B side. Mm -hmm. Oscar was the A side at that time. Really? Probably the last time ever Floyd really? ever been a beast that. Probably the last time ever. Yeah, a beast side from an odds perspective? No, from a from a promotional perspective. Promotional, who gets the most? Oscar was a bigger star at that time. I mean, wasn't Oscar kind of on his way out? He may have been on his way out from a skill standpoint, but at yeah. that time, like even Floyd said it. He said, Floyd, Floyd said, I know I was a B-side, and I bet on myself. I took that fight, and I said to myself, this is the last time I'll ever be a B-side. Okay. So to me, that was almost an acknowledgement that he took less money okay. and he knew Oscar was getting paid more. All right. And he was okay with that because he, and his whole thing was, you know, top rank Cho, he felt like top rank chose uh, Oscar over him as the guy to push. And that was one of the main reasons why he wanted to separate from top rank. This is the story that he's told, okay. you know, that, you know, Bob, Bob's machine was behind uh, uh, Oscar at the time. Okay. And that, you know, that whole thing with the HBO and all that was that was the story he told. So I say I use that reference to say, I mean, rightfully so. 
at the time. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, at the time, it made totally man, sense. Man. And it made sense for Floyd to bet on himself if he believed that much in himself that oh, he right. could become well, this. Floyd, Floyd bought, out, bought out his contract. We're uh, digressing. But he bought out his contract. But that, that's a whole other topic. Yes, yes. He bought it. Um, so, yeah. I, but m- my point is he had to accept who and what he was and what the situation was at the time and he didn't take less risk for fighting oscar de la hoya than he has when he's had any of the fights when he's been the a-side but if there is an acceptance of Mm -hmm. what is what is attainable at the time based off of the circumstances and sometimes you have to take less because that's all that is attainable you can't say hey well my risk is it my risk is the same as it was you know last month well last month there was a hundred million dollars to pay you this month there's only 50 million so do you want your share of the 50 million or do you want to sit up and say i'm not taking less risk and get none of it right so I get it. I get it. Look, I mean, the, the people that are willing to roll the dice and understand short term loss, long term gain have a better chance of ingratiating themselves to the fans and coming out of this uh, at the end uh, on the better side of it. Right. But that's just that's just kind of where where I'm thinking with that. But, you know, it is what it is. Let's go into our second championship. Round. Yes. All right, we are talking UFC, and the the, the question was posed: uh, right. What is the biggest upset? Now, right. there are quite a few um, underdogs here that kind of jump out at you a little bit. The biggest underdog on the card is uh, Smiling Sam Alvey, right. plus three fifteen. That is with, uh, and these odds of obviously of uh, courtesy of Bet Online. Uh, that so, is. Hmm? Well, I was going to say since, mm-hmm. well. It would be better since you're the expert here. Mm-hmm. For me to throw them out at you, and then you walk us through them. Right. Okay. How does that sound? That sounds good. Because you know you don't want me trying to break down these fights because it'll be like the guy's going to hit the guy, and the guy's going to fall down. He's going to do something with his arm, and the guy's going to start tapping. It's yeah. It's it's not good. I I can admit you know well. I don't like to admit a lot that I'm wrong, but okay. but I but I okay. <laughs> Let's do this. Stop it. So let's go through this. So yes. you you tell me the fight. I will give you the odds. And then you tell the audience if you think we have an upset there or if you think the favorite's going to win. Okay, go. Oh, I'm giving you the fights. You want me to give you the Yeah, fight. you tell me because, you know, so, I mean, we can start with, let's, let's just start from the, let's just go start right to the, the top. top. Let's go right to the top. Let's go to Ferguson and Gately, Okay. Service, Ferguson and Gaethje. Ferguson and Gaethje. I said Gaethje. Is, Gaethje. Yeah, Ferguson and Gaethje. A, it's a fantastic fight. The odds are you know, minus minus one ninety nine for Ferguson, plus one seventy four for Gaethje. Yeah, I think uh, I think it may be an updated one. Um, oh no, it just updated. Wow, that just like that yeah, literally at, just updated in the last fifteen minutes. Yes. So come it's, on, I yeah, got the updated odds. Yeah, updated odds is uh, totally so. I, honestly, it's coming. You're starting to get some money coming in on Gaethje, which is right. because the odds are dropping a little bit. It's a tough fight to call. It really is. Uh, there is some line value going with Gaethje for sure. Um, Tony's been battling injuries. He's older. Um, he's on a 12 fight win streak. So you start to wonder when that when that wheel is going to come off. You also look at the fact that uh, Tony doesn't dislike. Justin Gaethje, and I'm not sure if that's a good thing coming from this fight. There's a lot of mutual respect there, right. um, and this is not the guy he really wants to fight, and that sometimes can play a role. Uh, but my prediction is that Tony Ferguson is going to win this fight because he is overall the better mixed martial artist. So I would not go there, but there is it's not the dumbest pick if you were to go uh, because there is, like I said, some line value there, plus 174. Right. Bet $100 to win $174. So it well, is. Let me say this. Value. Under two and a half rounds is minus 140, which yes. means the odds makers that bet online feel that there's a good chance this fight doesn't go past to yeah and now i actually think that might be the better bet regardless of who wins regardless of who wins just fighting the total just betting on the total rounds one over two and a half rounds so if they get through over or under uh well the 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 favorite is that it's going to be under two and a half rounds so it's plus one over 
I could definitely imagine this fight going past two and a half rounds. Okay. I could. I, so, and I know that a lot of people think it's just going to be this brawl firefight. And I do think that could be the case. But both of these guys have been pretty tough to stop. Tony is almost impossible to stop. So I don't know. I could see it going over. I think that is the better bet than right. even going win loss. Okay. So um, there's, there's, there's your best bet right there for that fight. For that fight, right. Plus 110 over two and a half rounds. Yes. That's that's good line value, and you feel it has the higher probability of happening. I think it has I think it's a safer thing than to okay. try to go with just to try to pick the winner here because it's a very close fight. All right. So next fight for you. Is Dominic Cruz uh is the plus one ninety. Right. Uh we probably should have started at the other side because this we actually do that. is Tom. this this actually is right. my best up that pick. Uh, Dominic Cruz, there is some money coming in on him because originally he was um, a bigger underdog, but right now he's plus 190. Mm -hmm. So who knows, a minus 225 uh, favorite. For me, here's the thing. Uh, Dominic Cruz is a big bantamweight, mm -hmm. and he's 5'8". Uh, Henry Cejudo's 5'4". Okay. Uh, one of Cruz's, probably Cruz's best attribute, and he has plenty of, of strong attributes but his best attribute is his movement specifically east west movement so Hudo is if you were to compare him his striking to a boxer he is similar to ricky hatton in that his engagements are these north south rushes in mm -hmm. and out in and out the east west movement is not his is not his forte East West movement guys tend to give him a little bit of an issue because from a fluidity standpoint, he can be a little bit stiff. His athleticism is more like a fullback than a halfback. Right. So it's not a lot of swivel there. Dominic Cruz is going to give you plenty of swivel as long as he's 100%. The biggest question mark here is because Dominic Cruz hasn't fought in four years nearly. Right. And most of that is because of injuries, constant rehabbing of knee injuries and so on and so forth. So you don't know which Dominic Cruz you're going to get. His last fight, he lost the unanimous decision to Cody Garbrandt. So you don't really know which guy you're going to get. But I am going out on a bit of a limb in saying that I believe that you're going to see a strong Dominic Cruz performing today um, on Saturday. Uh, mental toughness is never an issue. This dude has been through all kinds of things. He doesn't even have to still fight if he doesn't want to. So when I see people still performing and still pushing to perform, even when I, I know that they don't necessarily have to, mm -hmm. uh, that says something to me about their mental preparedness. Also, another big thing was I saw with the ease in which he made weight today, which was a big concern because the whole weight cutting and, and making weight for this particular event is a little bit odd because of the circumstances and right. everything going on. He made 135 pounds like a champ, not 136, which would, well, he made the 135 pound championship weight, which is what you have to make for this fight. He made it like a champ. And that to me, and, and that might have had a, a lot to do with why money started to come in on him is because of how well he may weigh today. So I am a little bit more uh, feeling a little bit better about that pick, but I feel like that is really the biggest upset of the card. Uh, if you're looking at like an underdog to stay far, far away from, I would say it is the biggest underdog on the card, which is uh, Smiling Sam Alvey at plus 315. I just can't see a scenario that he beats Ryan Spann. And it's not even about Ryan Spann being this unbeatable or, or unstoppable guy. It's just it's... Sam Alvey is at that point in his career uh, where he has, I think, maximized what he could get out of his body. And Ryan Spann, is, these, you're talking about two guys who Errol is pointing in the exact opposite direction. So that is the one you want to stay away from, for sure. Okay, so that's your stay away fight. Yes. Well, you know, I want to ask you something, because going back to Cruz, the over four and a half rounds mm -hmm. is minus 205. Yes. So clearly, everyone thinks this is going to distance. Yes. And plus one sixty five under. What do you? What are your thoughts on that decision? See, I, I definitely think decision, and and that though that right there makes me say, so we think that Henry Cejudo is going to win a decision over Dominic Cruz. That's what they're thinking. Meaning that's what that's what the odds tell you. I like Dominic's chances to win this fight so much more. If it say it again. 
I like his chances to win so much more if this goes a decision. So if the odds are that it is going to go over four and a half rounds, which would obviously denote that it's going to be a decision. Right. So I basically bet, bet, bet 100 to make 190 on bet online. Not bad at all. Yeah, I, I like I, I really like Dominic Cruz uh, as my upset pick for this fight. All right. I love it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So uh, as usual, you make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Uh, click that notifications bell as well so that you'll get uh, indication when new videos go live. And also make sure you check out all of my picks for UFC 249. The card is tomorrow. And we're jumping right back into action for the May 13th card. So we'll be putting out picks, odds, and predictions for that uh, for that event as well. So for my man, Peter Kahn, I appreciate you guys watching as always. God bless and peace.